welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today, it's great to have Susan Baum on the podcast. Dr. Baum is the director of the TUI Center for Research and Professional Development at Bridges Academy, a school for twice exceptional children. She's also provost of the Bridges Graduate School of Cognitive Diversity and Education. She's the author of many books and articles, primarily focusing on understanding and nurturing the needs of special populations of gifted, underachieving students, including the award-winning third edition of her seminal work, To Be Gifted and Learning Disabled. Her research and experience in the field of twice exceptional education have earned her much recognition. Oh boy, I could list all the awards, Susan, that you've won. You've won a lot. But I just want to say thank you so much for being on this podcast. It's such an honor to have you here. Well, thank you for asking me. I look forward to talking with you. As you know, I'm a big, big fan of yours and love the work you've done to uh, pioneer this field of 2E, twice exceptionality. Let's talk a little about how you got interested in this topic. What was your like disser- dissertation on in graduate school? It was looking at students with superior cognitive abilities and how being gifted or learning disabled made them different populations. So I think it was trying to see if there were statistical differences among kids who were identified as learning disabled with average ability, kids who were identified as superior with an IQ of 120 or more without a disability, and those who had both. They were identified with learning disability, and their IQ was in the superior range. Cool. Not not a big fan of the the, the label d- superior. <laughs> I know. Neither was I. But at that point, we didn't want to use the word gifted. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I don't know which is worse. That's a good point. So around that time when you're working on that, first of all, who was your advisor? Joe Renzulli. Joe Renzulli was your advisor. Now, what year was this? 1985. So around this time, it's 1985, and you're doing this this foundational work. What were like? What was the landscape of the field at that time within gifted education? How much did they appreciate uh, the fact that you could be both learning disabled and gifted? It was just beginning. I had trouble convincing my committee during my doctoral program that I should even be looking at this population. They felt really? that, yeah, they said, you're talking about such a, so very few kids. And, you know, I don't know if it's going to be worth your time or energy looking at them. Maybe you're talking about 1% of 5% of the population. And boy, were they wrong. There were some people doing some work in this field, Joanne Whitmore, June Maker, some amount of work coming out of Johns Hopkins, mm. but it really wasn't catching on. Not yet. Yeah. No, I feel you. I don't think it's, it still hasn't caught on <laughs> in education in 2020. It's kind of caught on with people who are not in education in ways that it hasn't caught on with people in education. You know? <laughs> well, so can you tell our audience what that means to be 2E? What, what does that mean to you? To me, it means that you are a puzzling paradox. There are so many things that you do very well, better than most people, that people just look at you and say, gee, you're smart. And there are very simple things, perhaps like spelling or knowing your math facts and things that other people seem to have little difficulty with that you just can't do. So it it presents this paradox of behaviors that are difficult to live with. Yeah. And everyone, to a certain degree, shows strengths and weaknesses, right? So, so there's a specific population, 2E, where you're extreme on, on both the gifted side and the disabled side? Yeah. 
And sometimes it seems more subtle, but the discrepancy makes it difficult. That, you know, if you are capable of high intellectual conversation and can't put anything in writing, that's hard for people to accept in themselves and for others to say, you must be just lazy. You, you know, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to write out your ideas, so to speak, or do well, focus better in areas that you are uncomfortable or understand the social climate when you're so smart. Right. No, I hear you. And I'm just thinking, because you've talked a lot of about how person's learning disability can can suppress their giftedness. And so it's not so evident or so obvious that a student is gifted. How do you tell the difference between a learning disabled, ungifted student and a learning disabled, gifted student? And, and does that question even make sense to you? Well, it makes sense in the fact that I think about kids who have been identified because of a learning disability and they might be receiving special ed services, you know that profile. And people aren't looking for what's special about that child in terms of their interest levels, their ability to be creative, their interest areas. They're just not looking. And no one is thinking that those areas are important. So they're hard to figure out if you're not looking for those things. Rather, why aren't you reading better? Why aren't you spelling better? Why aren't you able to process information? And no one's paying attention to the wonderful engineer that you might be building with these extraordinary things, you know, building extraordinary monuments with a set of Legos. And so there that child is, they say, oh yeah, he can build with Legos, but just can't read. And no one cares that he can build with Legos. Yeah. But that's important. That's very important information, much more important than paying attention to the fact that, yes, he needs reading support right now. Unless what they're doing requires reading. Exactly right. And then if it does require reading, like reading the directions to build whatever they're building with Legos, somehow they seem to be able to compensate (laughs) and reading works in that situation. Somehow they know enough about Legos that they can decode. But if you have them read their textbook, not so much. How do you, what do you, what do you put within the purview of giftedness? What, what counts as gifted? Here it is. It's, it's hard. I, I am very liberal in my definition of gifted. Yeah. Uh, it may show up in an IQ profile if you're looking at subtests. But more importantly for me is the kinds of interests that child has and the depth that they have in in that interest area is high levels of creativity. It's shown by knowledge they have about a certain topic that most people don't have. It's the ability to think critically about something, argue with people with a coherent argument verbally. There's so many behaviors that don't translate into grades in school or scores on an IQ test but much more behaviorally how they're navigating the world. And then the other thing that I pay attention to is that sometimes their giftedness is seen in their ability to circumvent their problems. So they become very good at coming up with excuses why they can't do something. They might come up with 25 reasons why they didn't do their homework or why you shouldn't do the math problem that way. And they might come up with 25 reasons why it's stupid to learn history. But people think about that as making excuses, and they don't say, what a great divergent thinker that young person is. Oh, divergent thinking. You just brought divergent thinking. So divergent thinking is, what is that? Is that a a form of creativity? That's really important. If you can't think divergently, you're going to have a hard time coming up with something original or new. You have to, that out of the box thinking is such a strong characteristic of creativity. And so many of these kids are such out of the box thinkers, but they use them to survive a system sometimes instead of something that people are looking for. You find that uh, sometimes students from 
uh, minority populations, ethnic racial minority students, when they act creative, is it viewed differently than when someone else is being creative? Like, are there any research on that? I don't know of research about culturally diverse people. We if, about the research, other than the fact that if we're trying to identify these kids as gifted. We need to be looking at performance of these kinds of kids, especially giving them a, a task that involves divergent thinking. And we identify many more kids as gifted through their diver divergent thinking. I don't know that it's better than kids who are not a Caucasian, but they do seem to have that wonderful ability to problem solve and to use things in ways that they weren't intended because they don't have those tools that, for instance, playing with toys. They don't have the toy. I don't know if this has to do with cultural diversity or if it's about poverty. But when you are having to invent things because no one gives you the things, that's certainly a trait that shows creative potential. For sure. And it's not, doesn't seem to be too terribly appreciated when a teacher wants you to pay attention to their lesson plan and all you want to do is create something new. Yeah, because you've got the ability to do that and because it holds your attention and because you see a use for it. Mm. And too often uh, we don't use enough creativity in the curriculum so that people could recognize this as a potential for high levels of creativity. I'd like to take a moment to talk about our sponsor, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? For quite a lot of us right now during this coronavirus pandemic, we are struggling with our most fundamental basic needs, such as our needs for security, connection, and opportunities to master our work. I think all of us could use some therapy right now. I know I sure could, which is why I've really been enjoying working with a professional therapist at BetterHelp so I can realize the best version of myself even under the current circumstances. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating with your therapist in just under 48 hours. Note that it's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. In fact, the service is available for clients worldwide. What I really like about BetterHelp is that you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as you often have to do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is really committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Here's a recent one. Camilla helped me turn my life around. Everything has been so positive for me since our first session. Deep gratitude. I'm pleased to announce a special offer for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. You can get 10% off your first month of professional counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash psychpodcast. That's better H-E-L-P slash psych podcast. Join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Okay, now back to the show. You've done work on creativity. You've done work, well, you've done work on everything. You've done work on multiple intelligences theory. Is that right? And did you do a book with Howard Gardner? You edited a book with him or something? Is that right? Yeah, he, he asked a team of us to write a book that he was asked to write, but he didn't want to write it. So he would edit, you know, he would be our editor, if you will. Yeah. And, uh, but he didn't want to write it. And it was trying to use his theory more authentically in school. Because a lot of people misused that theory and made it seem like everyone was gifted and made it seem like you needed to do things in eight different ways when that was never, ever his intent. Okay. What was his intent, do you think? Intent was to be able to understand that the brain deals with different contents or inputs differently, not about modality, but some of us 
deal with numerical symbols. Some of us can deal with music, the content of music. Some of us deal better with lang- words, and some of mm-hmm. us deal better with spatial input. So it was kind of what area of the brain deals best with numerical content. And maybe some brains do that really well, mm-hmm. where others deal with verbal content in, in a better way. So beginning to look at, I guess we should call them talents, but he chose to call them intelligences, probably what got him into trouble. <laughs> right. He would not, got, not have gotten in trouble if he just said multiple talent theory. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. He wouldn't have been as controversial. Yeah, but I, he wanted to. I remember him saying, "If I call it multiple talents, nobody would buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> I call it multiple intelligences. It's more intriguing." He wanted the idea to, to get widely disseminated. Yeah, but it's been very helpful in us understanding kids who are twice exceptional because it gives you a way of looking at what these kids can and cannot do. Right in a more concrete way. Right, yeah. And you, you've you developed your own assessment tools for this, right? Am I right? You, you have a strengths finder sort of thing? Yeah, we, we, do, we, we do look at trying to find out kids' abilities through what they're interested in, where their talents lie, and begin to look for patterns. And so, and, and what we try to do is say, you know, with these patterns of talent, these kids are our future philosophers. These kids are our future lawyers because, boy, do they argue well. And they have the great vocabulary and they can argue anything. And they might not do well on an intelligence test in mathematical reasoning, perhaps. But we do get to see that in the real yeah. world are all kinds of talents made up of different patterns of abilities. And our tool kind of tries to find what are those talents of abilities that's defined by perhaps their personality, their interests, the things they like to create. So it's trying to be a little bit more concrete than using an abstract or to predict what these kids may do in the future. Yes, I, well, you know, I love that. But some students are really good at abstract stuff, so there, st- there still needs to be a place for those who score sky high even on the traditional measures, right? Right. So for me, I, I don't prefer one way over another. If you can put together some evidence that shows that what you can do needs to be nurtured and, need, and, is, and needs services that other kids may not require. You know, and I think that's the definition of gifted. These kids are showing different potentials in ways that their peers do not show it, which requires us to provide ways for that talent to be developed in ways that may be different than what we're offering these kids. Right. Yeah. No, I hear you. And and, and we're not just talking about ability or or talent. Can you tell me more about this? program uh, assessment you came up with to help people understand personality aspects of themselves as well? Because you go beyond intelligence, right? We developed something we call the suite of tools nice. that has some uh, assessments within it. So the suite of tools is trying to gather uh, information about who this child is in terms of their strengths, interests, talents. And part of the assessment is something called clues. And that is where we try to collect information that's from existing IQ tests from this thing we call the learning print. And the learning print is working with a child where that child identifies the best ways they like to learn, the things they're curious about, things that their hobbies, what they like to do outside of school what kinds of lessons they've had that they've absolutely adored. So we put that together, and then we have another tool called the Quick Personality Indicator, which we have four different personality types that are similar to people like the Myers-Briggs. What are the four? Well, the four that we use 
the practical manager, and this is your sequential learner who's great with details, mm -hmm. who loves to think in a very linear way. And uh, these people are great programmers, and their and their creativity often is shown by making anybody else's idea better. Mm -hmm. They have an attention to details that far exceeds my attention to details. Yeah. And so and one that we call learned expert, meaning these are your scholars. These are people who are great at arguing. They love to give their opinion. They like to challenge theories. They like to create their own theories. And then there's another type that we call the creative problem solver, who are the inventors, who are the out-of-the-box thinkers, who are the tinkerers, who just you know, they can be great entrepreneurs and they, or they can be great inventors or just great new ways of doing old stuff. They're really good at that. And then there are people, the other styles, people persons who have wonderful ways to be ambassadors, to get people to work harmoniously with each other, to, to use an emotional, their emotions to become artists or poets. But we're never one thing. We're really all four of them. So what we try to figure yeah. out is what's your profile? Because when I have to be linear, I can be really linear, but it's not a place I like to be. Yeah. <laughs> and if I have to be in that place every day, 24 seven, it really does damage to my psyche. Oh, your soul. But I can use that, uh, those skills or yeah. that part of my personality when I have to, but I can't live there. I really need to live in a place that's more like to create a problem solver and the people person. I'm, I'm a happier individual if I could work from that perspective. But truthfully, we're never one thing. But I know that if I have a job, I, better ha I do a better job if it aligns to what my personality strengths are, where I can use those strengths more of the time than being stuck in this more linear mode. For instance, right now, uh, we're putting together papers for accreditation, and I can do it, but it's driving me crazy because I don't want to deal with those details, and I can't every single day yeah. fill in all those details. You know, it's just not a, a happy place for me. It's not a happy not, place for you. You're not going to get the best out of me there. <laughs> So, well, well, then tell us a little bit about what you're trying to get accreditation for. In, in other words, tell us about this new cognitive diversity degree, graduate school. It's very exciting. I'm very excited about it. Exciting. So that, that, that fourth tool, let me go back, finish up, you know, what we do with these tools. We try to collect what we know about kids from existing information and their learning print and their QPI. But then, and this is what the school is going to become known for, using those to come up with a strength-based, talent-focused approach to their development. And so when we really understand who these kids are, we can better understand how to leverage their strengths. We can better understand how to use what their personal best to engage them in learning. And also looking at those talents that beg for development, to give them all a talent plan. What is your personal talent plan? Where, what kinds of experiences do you need to go along, to, to, to navigate that journey? And so it's a different way of looking at development, intellectual development, emotional development, social development. And so our graduate school has three programs to help professionals work with families, schools, uh, adults. How do we help you become the best that you can be, even if you have these cognitive differences that people see as deficits? We see them as strengths. Well, I love that you're applying the strengths-based approach to a field that hasn't really traditionally focused on it especially the field of special education. I feel like gifted education focuses on strengths because that's all about giftedness, but special ed, not so much. Well, so can you tell us then about this graduate school? Yeah, so... Do you want to talk about the graduate school? I always want to talk <laughs> about the graduate school. 
because now it's been in existence about 18 months and we're seeing such great results. Good. It was kind of a dream, a vision. But what we're beginning to see is a group of dedicated professionals and, and some of our parents as well who see that this is the way they would like to begin to look at their own children and to change the field, many different fields. So we offer a certificate program in twice exceptional education, which is a 15 credit program. And when, and people in our programs, everybody ends up with this certificate certificate because it is the foundational courses and how we begin to look at kids differently, how we begin to embrace neurodiversity, how we begin to understand that you may have the challenges of ADHD, but because you have an ADHD wired brain, you tend to be more creative and you tend to be better in certain fields and better careers and to begin to bring those two pieces together and how we can begin to look at instruction in a way that brings out the best in you. All right. So we have that program. Then we have a master's degree program in cognitive diversity in education. And that is a 30 credit program where you, you know, you begin to be able to bring to your own, say you're a coordinator of gifted. Well, you can do it better because you'll be able to take those kids who also have challenges and and then embrace them and bring them into your program. Or you can sit at a team where they're trying to come up with an educational mm-hmm. plan and you can offer different perspectives about what's best for that child. Or you can be a counselor and look at these kids differently. Or even an educational therapist who adds a different dimension to your program. And then our most exciting part, of course, is and the, our EDD program. And you can focus on social justice where cognitive diversity needs a more positive spin. Or you can look at it in terms of developing curriculum and instruction that uses kids' strengths, talents, and interests as a way of developing curriculum. Or you can become a leader, a director of a school, someone who wants to start their own school. There are a lot of schools for 2 week kids popping up. Mm. And the leaders, we have several of, of people who are the heads of, of schools who really want to make a difference and have models of schools that can work better for these kinds of children. Well, what if you're, you can't get access to this graduate program? You're an educator who wants to uh, identify these kinds of students, serve them. What, what can they do in their public school system or private school system? Just a teacher listening to this podcast right now that doesn't have all these resources you're talking about. I think all of us have to begin to look at what the child is doing well rather than what the child is not doing well. A good teacher is one who knows how to deal with the child, sees a gift in the child's strengths and interests. A superior teacher is one that can see the gift in their fault. Oh, maybe I say great teacher. I don't like the word superior. <laughs> the way you said it, but yeah. I, that's what I mean, because you can see the promise in that child. Yeah. And to begin to notice when the child is having a good day, and what did you do as a teacher that allowed that child to have a good day? Just do more of it. Maybe you did origami that day in school, and this child who's always been problematic who's always made you worry about what you're not doing for that child. But that day, the day that you did origami in your classroom, this child was phenomenal. Well, then you have to figure out, how can I use origami more in the curriculum? Or that child might be very spatial. Mm. How can I have more assignments and options for that child that allows them to be the builder, to allow them to use their art ability in my math curriculum or in my science curriculum. And if we just begin to think that way, we'll serve many more kids and then we'll begin to look at them and honor and value what they can do, which brings other kids in the classroom to begin to look at those children differently as well. 
all of a sudden they want that child to teach them how to do origami or teach them how to be great in drama or whatever it is that you're doing in an area in which that child can excel rather than always find a way to help the child do what he can't do. Oh yeah. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. And you have this metaphor about the complexities of green. So what does, it, what does it mean to be green as opposed to yellow or blue? Our metaphor says that these kids have these, you know, paradoxical behaviors. So there's this gifted side, the side that shows their high abilities, the, ch- the side where they excel. And that we call yellow. And then there are those challenges that make them blue on any given day. But they're, depending on the environment, they're both yellow and blue. They really are green. Now, are they blue-green? Or are they yellow-green? Now, there's different shades of green. But when they're green, it means you can't leave their giftedness outside while you deal with their challenge. And so, for instance, if they are having trouble reading, or having trouble decoding, and you're trying to water down the curriculum. So they're trying to read and you're giving a linguistic approach. A man can fan. Well, maybe they can decode those words, but they have no interest in those words. They have these bright minds. But instead, if you use poetry, for instance, my favorite one, maybe Robert Frost, whose woods are these, I think I know. Those are first grade words. Yeah. Whose woods are these, I think I know. Those aren't hard words. But the message is complex as we go on with that poem. And poetry is written in, perceptually in a way that these kids can decode because there are not a lot of words on the page. And if you took that poem and you took it out of a picture book of Robert Frost poetry, then we see some beautiful works of art that a lot of these kids could relate to. And they can read those words and they can talk about what does that poem mean? Miles to go before I sleep. Mm. And we've got all the pieces together. And that yellow could come out because the environment isn't putting them in something to read that they're so overwhelmed by the words on the page that you see the darkest side of them. You see them do behaviors to avoid the task. You see them rubbing their eyes and, mm. and being overwhelmed. But they're green. They need to make sure that their yellow part of their brain can work as you're trying to get them to become better readers. They're, comp- they're, they're very complex. And to look at them as two different people, they have the gifted side, let's work on that, and the challenging side, let's just work on that. You can't separate them. They're always together. And so it behooves us to what we call dually differentiate the curriculum. So let me get this right. So the yellow is the giftedness and the, and the, um, uh, what's in the learning disability is blue, blue. Okay. Why, why do you, blue could have been giftedness. Why do you associate? It doesn't matter. It's arbitrary, right? Yellow is everything good in the world, and blue oh. is, you know, kind of a. Uh, if you're saying that I'm so blue today, oh, so you know, so then it worked out very well to have green as a metaphor. Then. <laughs> go go go! Because right? yeah. we always say, then Kermit the Frog would say, "It isn't easy being green." Oh yeah, that does work out. Did you come up with this? Yes. How did you, were you just like? Did was an epiphany? I knew that TUI was, the whole was greater than the sum of the mm. parts. So I was actually talking to my friend, Rachel McAnellen, who does a lot of, who, who's known as Miss Math. She's a good friend of mine. I said, I think this is mathematical. You know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So she start, we start talking about colors. Mm. And so she, we were talking about, yeah, it's just when you mix colors together. Mm. So if you mix more blue then yellow, you're going to get deeper green. And, you know, and so we were just fooling around with the mathematics of color. Wow, I love Mary. And then it, it 
referred to, then we began to think about, well, you're right. If I take yellow to be giftedness and blue to be the challenging part, and we start mixing them together, we're going to get green. But the environment is going to determine, you know, what the shades of green, because we know that in certain environments, you hardly notice a disability. The child just absolutely shines because the environment is right. Put this same child in an environment that's demanding they use a, a skills in areas of their weakness. Yeah, It's a really, really hard hill to climb. Hard hill. And so if we can get the environment to tip towards yellow by using their, their gifts, the child is in a better position to be successful. Yeah. And that's career orientation. I mean, you and I have talked about that. If you can pick a career that keeps you that the, where the demands are more of the things you're good at, yeah. then forces you to be always accommodating and trying to get around your weak area, you know, it, life is going to work better for you. And so this part of your mm. own way of making decisions about the kind of career in which that is going to keep you, it's going to become a passion area and where you have to get around your disabilities to a much lesser degree. In recent years, the idea of learning styles has come under fire. As, as you know, how, how, do, how, does, how do strengths differ from learning styles? I think learning styles for me grew out of the special ed movement when we were trying to find out if these kids were auditory learners or more visual learners or kinesthetic learners. We know that we can learn in all any of those modalities. And we probably have a preferred way of learning given the choice. Mm -hmm. But no one is saying that the only way anybody can learn if they're a kinesthetic learner, the only way they can learn is kinesthetically. I am a Brunerian. I love, yeah, me too. love the work of Jerome Bruner. And I really liked him, his modes of, of learning, the inactive mode, the iconic mode, and the symbolic mode, yeah. right? So when you're little developmentally, most of what we learn is through our muscles, yeah. is through understanding things experientially. But let me, I don't care what stage of your development you're in. If you're learning to ski, you're going to learn better and actively than you are about reading about skiing, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But for some, so I like the idea if we can start off in the inactive mode and then visualize it. And everyone says that if you're going to understand something, you're better off if you can visualize it. You should have a picture in your brain. And then when you get on into a discipline and you're really well versed in it, you can learn it symbolically. What is the symbols of that discipline? Mm -hmm. You know, if you have that scientific mind, then you can look at chemical formulas. If you are really extraordinarily, you're a great psychologist, understanding, you know, um, how emotion impacts the brain is something that's very comfortable. You don't need the inactive mode anymore. I like that way of looking at learning, not are you a visual learner or an act? It, it depends what you're learning, if it's better to learn skiing kinesthetically. But I, so I kind of think Bruner, who very much influenced Gardner, yeah. um, <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. as a way of thinking about, you know, there's just different symbol systems and different times, depending on what you're learning, that make you better at what you do. And I, so I think it's more complex than just saying, figure out their learning style. You know, it might be more of a learning preference for that particular thing you're learning. I'd like to tell you about one of my favorite methods for learning new things. These days, it can be really hard to find the time to sit down and learn more. It's not easy when the likes of social media can be so addictive and time consuming. So you may think you don't have the time to develop yourself. But there's an app I highly recommend that really helps with this. It's called Blinkist. Blinkist is for anyone who cares about learning, but doesn't have a lot of time. 
Winkus takes the key ideas and insights from over 4,000 non-fiction bestsellers in more than 27 categories and gathers them together in 15-minute text and audio explainers that help you understand more about the core ideas. Use the blinks to get into a topic quickly, find new topics to grow from, or figure out which books you want to spend more time reading or listening to more deeply. What's more, they've teamed up with popular podcast creators to blink those for you too, so you can get at the heart of a podcast episode fast. With high quality audio, you can jump right into the on the go, during your commute, at the gym, around the house, or even download to listen offline. With high quality audio, you can jump right in on the go, during your commute, at the gym, around the house, or even download to listen offline. 15 million people are already using Blinkist to broaden their knowledge in 27 nonfiction categories, including self-improvement, personal growth, management, leadership, and mindfulness and happiness. Personally, I like Blinkist because it gives me really useful takeaways of a book, which then helps me evaluate whether I want to take the full time to read the book later. Also, sometimes I listen to a book on Blinkist that I've already read, as it offers a good refresher and prep for upcoming podcast interviews. I tend to use Blinkist while taking a walk, and find it relaxing to learn new information so easily. I've listened to the bestseller Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, and within the most popular psychology category, I've listened to The Brain by David Eagleman. With Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books, all the books you want, and all for one low price. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com Scott to start your free 7-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist Premium Membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash Scott to get 25% off and a 7-day free trial. Blinkist dot com slash Scott. Okay, now back to the show. Regardless of what quote-unquote multiple intelligence you have slash talent or learning style or et cetera. You have talked about in your book, the importance of working memory. Like there are certain abilities that cut across all intelligences, which is why I personally think there's such a thing as a general intelligence. Maybe not, it doesn't exist in the world. It's a latent variable or it's an emergent property, but there are some basic cognitive limitations that will impact your learning across multiple fields and multiple symbol systems. And you talk a little bit about that in your book, which I thought that was really cool, in a section called Two-E Students in Learning. And you talk about long-term memory and working memory. So talk a little about Two-E learners and, and how working memory might be a bottleneck for some of them. It's a bottleneck for most of them, but the research does show that if you're an expert in a domain, your working memory is can handle more information. So it used to say, you know, it's you have five to seven elements that you can remember, but not if you're the expert. So that led me to believe that if you're really an artist, the working memory for visual details in a, in a work of art might function better than when we're talking and we're using linguistics. And if we take information from working memory and code it into long-term memory as an image or as, uh, or verbally, or some linguistic um, synapse occurs, I think that matters. I think that depending on where, I think you might have working memory for music. That might be amazing that you don't have for verbal language. And this came, this occurred to me when I was doing some grant work in New York City. And we had a grant to look at children who were <clears throat> advanced in either music or dance. The steps that they could remember in dance, when they couldn't remember the steps to a math problem because the working memory didn't process that way, was very meaningful to me. There's got to be a, something about they could do it kinesthetically. Yeah. It's the same working memory. Or, or they could not. be playing a piece of music and it was afro-caribbean music mm. it was very complex with different kids coming into that piece of music at different times in their role 
was different with the drums and the person next to them on the cymbals, why could they focus? Why was their working memory okay for music and it wasn't okay for reading? And one child told us that my music is helping me learn to read better because music, it has to flow. If I'm going to decode a word, I can't keep sounding it out. It has to just flow. And so I am really interested in how does the working memory work with different symbol systems, with different content? And if it does work better musically, can I use music to help that child read better? And that's what we began to think about strength-based. I want that child to read. I want them to be more fluent with linguistic symbols. And they can do it in music. I want to understand this better. How can we use music then to get that child to read more fluently? And that's kind of what's behind that conversation in the book about let us understand that information processing model. And I don't find many people talking about it in that way. No. It's a very fascinating and rich research area that you're talking about. When I was an undergraduate a long, long time ago, uh, and I did my honors thesis, I was curious at the extent to which musical expertise, I was interested in the psychology of music and IQ, and the extent to which people who have expertise in music can override some of the working memory limitations, the domain general working memory limitations, and they could. And, you know, I think Anders Ericsson, who passed away recently, but honors Erickson's work showing that experts can circumvent some of these limitations, I think is, is just shows the power of expertise and mastery. Yeah. And I don't think there's enough research in it or it wasn't, um, Forstein looking at music, helping with very cognitively delayed individuals. Was it his work? I'm mm-hmm. trying to think of for Ruben Forstein. You know, the work that he did with uh, cognition, he was looking at people very challenged. And I thought music was part of what he was looking at. It might not, it might, that might not be right. It I'm might not, not sure. be here. I'm sorry. I'm not, you could um, be right. I don't know. But it's not, I mean, what Howard Gardner says, we're not talking about putting music on in the background. That's, that's personal preference of how you like to learn. That's not helping your cognition. But it, it's very different that if you, if you think about, there's, there's music that plays in your head when you see certain characters under stress or when you're understanding the psychology of a people by looking at their music. Their resilience comes out in the kinds of music they write. I, I just think this is very fascinating. I don't do enough of my own research in it other than read about others looking at those kinds of things. But I, I really think that's what the basis of strength-based education is. We work with a, a, a program with Williams Syndrome students who happen to have a strength in music and they have a weakness in math. Right. That's their cognitive pattern. And we worked with these kids, teaching them, they understood up and down in music. And they were beginning to, and they, but they didn't know graphing. But by teaching them musical scales and that the musical scale was n- nothing but a graph, they were able to get them to begin to graph things like the weather. Nice. Because they understood up and down musically. And we were able to bridge it to make them then understand it quantitatively. It's beautiful. It's such an innovative, progressive way of thinking about education. And I can't say that all all teachers are there yet. No, no. I don't think they really get strength-based talent focus. They think it's going back to just simply learning style, which is not getting a good press at the moment. Or growth growth mindset. Or growth mindset, right. But I do think, you know, as you know, and if we even look at Vygotsky, I think there is a way to offer instruction if we understand how best that particular child's brain works and what symbol systems seem to align with that brain wiring. So I want to end with the fact that it doesn't just take one teacher, it takes a community. 
look, I love your book. You know I love it. People should buy it. Uh, it's called To Be Gifted and Wording Disabled, and I recommend the new edition. The first and second editions are great, obviously, but the third edition is, is, is a little different and uh, updated. I'd like to end my podcast today on the same note in which you ended your beautiful book, and that's on the importance of a community of support. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, how parents can help, what community resources might be available, these sorts of things. That's one of the reasons that we uh, started the graduate school, because we do need a community of, of support. And so if your child was going to need a neuropsych, we need people, neuropsychologists, who understand the two-e child so they can look at a WISC profile. Mm. They can look at these correlate tests and come out with the idea that there's this gifted side that needs to be nurtured as much as this other side mm. that needs to be fixed. We need people in the community who could be models for these kids. If you have a young gymnast, they need to be working with gymnasts in the community. We need parents to be opportunity makers for these kids, you know, and to be able to hook them up with people who could be role models for Mm -hmm. these kids because they have similar brains. We need to have your neighbors who have the similar interests to these kids interact with them over lunch sometimes. And we definitely need teachers to work in collaboration with families to come up, to become a team to support the children emotionally, socially, and intellectually. Wonderful. Susan, thanks so much for the legendary work that you've done in the field and for supporting me so much and me wanting to make a contribution to the field. You've been so supportive. So thank you so much. And thank you for becoming a new leader in the oh. field because we need, we need to move this field forward to the next level. We need all these kids to transcend. Us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of the podcast on iTunes and subscribe to the Psychology Podcast YouTube channel as we're really trying to increase our viewership on YouTube. In fact, many of these episodes are in video format on YouTube, so you'll definitely want to check out that channel. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.